this very nice uh, conference. Um, uh, and it's a pity that I cannot, could not go this time, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so my talk today, it's about, uh, so the, the main idea of this talk, it's uh, to discuss like uh, some concepts of, uh, use some concepts of uh, uh, data science and supervised learning to study data sets that uh, we, we find in many body physics, uh, quantum many body physics. Um, so let me start the introduction. And basically the, let's say, I would say the main motivation of the, for this talk is that in, we have, in many body physics, we have uh, large data sets, right? As in daily life, right? So here, as an example of uh, a handwritten uh, data set and, uh, and in many body physics, I mentioned here some examples like in quantum computing, like quantum simulators. So these, all these quantum machines, they, they generate uh, large data sets essentially. Okay? Also in, in simulations. So here are like pictures of like Monte Carlo simulations. Okay? So basically the set of pictures you can think as a, a a large, uh, large data set. Okay. More specifically, you can think as a, as a table, right? With uh, each line of this table is a picture, right? Represents, uh, let's say, the bits of the picture, right? So this is a data set, right? And the question is, can we extract information of this uh, raw data set, right? Uh, in such a way that in, in our context here of physics, can you characterize phase of matter or phase transition? Uh, and the key aspect is that. Um, so, of course, if I give you this data set, you can compute physical observables, right? You can compute magnetization and then try to characterize the system. But here, the idea is to try to characterize the data set as a whole, right? And one important aspect is that, uh, like, generic data set has a structure. Okay? So here, the, and one, one feature of data sets that you are be interested in studying here is what is called an intrinsic dimension. Okay? So let me give you uh, an idea what is this uh, intrinsic dimension, okay? So and then, I will start with a, a synthetic data set. Okay, so here is a data set um, with three coordinates. Okay, so basically uh, I can generate, so here in the imaging, these points here are points from a probability distribution that I, I invented in my, in my mind. And I can sample this probability distribution. And then I have this data set here, the illustration of this data set. And the idea of this intrinsic dimension is that despite this data set, is embedded in a space with three dimensions, right? It has three coordinates. I can uh, lay down this, uh, this data set in a manifold that has an effective dimension equal to one. Okay, so this is the idea of intrinsic dimension. So this, this is the minimum number of uh, like degrees uh, of freedom that you have to use to describe your data set without loss. Okay. Um, and the question here is like, what happens with physical data sets, right? So let me be, be a bit more specific what I mean by physical data sets. And I start with uh, uh, like one of the main uh, quantities that we have to, to consider when you are studying like a system in thermal equilibrium, right? So it's the partition function. And uh, just to, to process, uh, just for pedagogical reason, I start with a classical system, right? So basically, here's the energy of a system, a classical system. And basically, um, like I have a, this sum here that is a sum over exponential large number of configuration, right? Of, uh, of if you want of points in a high dimensional space, right? But the idea is that for a given system and a given temperature here, so beta is the inverse of the temperature, most of this configuration will be, uh, you'll be weight, you have weights that is essentially close, super close to zero, right? So, um, so but this way we can, uh, gen uh, can, gener uh, can generate a, a physical data set, right? Or a partition function data set. And, to be a bit more specific, let, let me consider uh, to start a, a very simplified uh, data set, okay, a very simplified model. So here it's a, a model with just three spins. Okay? And basically I, uh, the data set here is defined in terms of the angles of these spins, right? That, uh, so these spins uh, lives in a, in a plane, it's an XY model, we call XY model. And basically, uh, you can sample this, uh, this partition function, right? Uh, for very low temperature and for very high temperature, right? And what you see is that if you do this, is that for very low temperature, basically, you, my data set lays, uh, lays down in a, in a manifold that has dimension equal to one, okay? While in high temperature, the data set has an intrinsic dimension equal to three, okay? So, so already for this very simplified uh, uh, example, we already can see that, uh, 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 like physical uh, properties play important role in this in this quantity intrinsic dimension. Right. 
So this is the, but this is a very simplified picture, right? It's a very simplified uh, situation. The idea here is that we want to study uh, this intrinsic dimension of uh, data sets that are generated, data sets of a many body system, right? Data sets that, that lives in a high dimensional space, okay? So then the, the, the basic, uh, uh, what I want to do, uh, in the, what we did in these works was to study what's the intrinsic dimension of data sets emerging in, on the, in the vicinity of uh, different kinds of phase transitions, right? Both classical to phase transition and also quantum phase transitions. Uh, so the, the, and then the, the questions that we, we raise here is like, uh, can you see some signatures of these transitions uh, in configuration space or can you extract universal uh, information about these transitions? So this is the, the, the main question that I will try to address uh, in this talk, okay? And here comes the outline of my, my, my talk. So basically first, I, 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 so we were not the first ones to, 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 to raise this kind of question, right? It's the question of learning physics from raw data sets. So there are a lot of other works that did that before that. So I try to do a, a brief review of these, the main works. Um, and now later I will try to explain better like this intrinsic dimension, right? That I, I, I try, I, I, introdu I introduce it in a pictorial way, but the point is that there are methods that uh, can be used to compute uh, uh, different methods that can be used to estimate the, this, this uh, feature of data set, this intrinsic dimension. And finally, I will show some results of uh, simulations, right? Basically, we generate data sets of simulations, then we, we, we see how is the intrinsic dimension across different kinds of phase transition. So this is the, the basic strategy of my talk. All right, so let me then try to motivate a bit more this, uh, so why we want to do this, right? Why you want to use this like machine learning, machine learning concepts to try to extract physics from raw, uh, raw, data, raw data sets, right? And so one important aspect is that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, so you have this data set uh, and typically what you do when you want to characterize a system, you compute uh, low order correlations or a order parameter and so on. But we believe that this data set uh, uh, has much more information than that, right? So, so the question, can you probe anybody's system beyond low order correlations, right? That can be important in deep, for different, uh, in different aspects, right? Uh, to, for example, characterize topological transitions, to characterize quantum order, right? That you cannot easily characterize with low order correlations. Okay? And also the, the, the important question of detect the important degrees of freedom of a system, right? So this is, uh, uh, something very important, right? That you, this kind of approach, uh, we hope that we can have some uh, um, uh, intuition about this, this kind of, right? So, so this is like um, two motivations, let's say, to, to do this kind of study. And now let me mention like some previous works that uh, like raise the same kind of question. So in fact, the, I think this kind of uh, like applications of machine learning uh, techniques and ideas to study like data sets of many body physics start more or less like five, six years ago. So one of the pioneer work um, this direction was this, this work that I'm showing this slide here. And the basic idea of this work, uh, let me just, uh, just mention the basic idea, I won't enter into details, but it's to use a, a, a supervised machine learning, right? So basically, you have uh, your, your configurations, right? And then you have to label these configurations, right? So here you can say, okay, this configuration is a ferromagnetic state. And this configuration here is a, a disordered state, right? And then you can use these labeled configurations to train what is known as a artificial neural network. Uh, and then this artificial neural network, this machine, uh, you learn, you use this machine to, to, to characterize, uh, to, to classify other configurations that you, you don't know if it's feral or disorder. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Uh, you can use these for more complicated uh, transitions for more complicated systems. And people already use that, but this is, uh, let's say the first work in this direction. But these use this idea of supervised machine learning. You need uh, label configurations. You have to label the configuration. So you have to know the information. You, you have to know a priori some information about the system. So another strategy to try to extract uh, say physics from the data sets is to use what is called unsupervised machine learning, okay? 
So in this case, you don't need uh, you don't need to label the, the configuration. Okay? So you don't need, in principle, you don't need any kind of information about your system, right? So the basic idea here is to try to see structure in this data set. Okay? Well, one one uh, problem or one difficulty of doing this, this is that this data set, right? So each point here lives in, as I, as I mentioned before, lives in a space of high dimension, right? So, so the dimension here is, uh, scales with the number of sites spins, okay? So you cannot visualize this data set, right? So what people do, uh, people, you can, what you can do is you, you can use uh, what is called a dimension reduction techniques, okay? So the basic idea is to try to project these, these uh, points in a lower dimensional space, and then try to see structure of your data set in this lower dimensional space. Okay, so this is the, the idea. And there are different ways of doing that. The simplest way to do that is to use what is called principal component analysis. And it's simple because it's, so basically this method is just a linear transformation. Okay? So here's an example of, uh, so here, like each point here is a configuration of the 2D Eisen model, right? For different temperatures. So the color is related to the temperature. Okay, so one interesting thing that you see in this uh, data set is that as you lower the temperature and you cross the transition, um, we see that the formation of two clusters okay, in the data set. And these two clusters is related to, to the transition, is related to the order of the system. Okay? So basically it's two because you have a, a Z2 symmetry that you broke, okay? that you break. Uh, so you can characterize the transition and also the, the Given this structure of the data set in this lower dimension, you can characterize the, the, both the phase and the transition. Okay, so this is, uh, but this is a very simple method. So it works for the 2D Eisen model, but for more complicated transition, it doesn't work. And the main reason, like uh, one of the reasons that it doesn't work for more complicated transition is that is, this is a linear transformation, right? So, so if your data set uh, lays down in a manifold that is not uh, flat, uh, this method you give, uh, it won't give you, uh, uh, it won't be able to characterize uh, well the data set, right? So, but this is an approach, but here what we want to do is something different. So we want to use like, you want to study this intrinsic dimension, right? And basically uh, one important aspect of our, our study is that we don't need any kind of dimension reduction, right? So, you, so the, the intrinsic dimension, the method that we explain now is simply, uh, uh, we don't need to, to do dimension reduction to, to estimate this quantity. Okay, so now I want to discuss, I return again to the, the, this idea of intrinsic dimension, to this quantity, intrinsic dimension. And I want to discuss a bit how we can uh, estimate uh, uh, this, this quantity, right? So here, again, I return to this uh, synthetic data set, right? So basically the intrinsic dimension is equal to one. So just to mention this data set, so if you want to try to apply this principal component analysis here for this data set, it doesn't work is that this data set here uh, basically lives in a manifold that is not linear, right? So, so basically principal component analysis here, it would give an intrinsic dimension that is equal to three, so it's wrong. Uh, so, and the idea, yeah, there are, so uh, there are different approaches to, to, to estimate this quantity. So one of them, one of it is the, the this PCA, principal component analysis. There's also a, a methods that comes from statistical physics, like this called fractal approach. And also uh, more recently, it's, uh, some groups start to propose what is called a nearest neighbors approach to, to estimate this, uh, uh, this quantity. And here you use one of these approach. Uh, and the basic idea, so this is a purely geometrical approach. Okay? So the way that you arrive in the, in the definition of the intrinsic dimension is purely geometrical. And the basic idea, the basic ingredient that you have to to access, to compute, to, to, to estimate this quantity uh, are distance in configurational space. So you have to define a metric, you have to define the Euclidean, Euclidean or Hamming distance between the, your configurations or between your points, okay? And the idea is that you, you can relate these methods, so this nearest neighbors approach, it relate, they relate the, the, the intrinsic dimension, okay? With the, the, the statistics of this nearest neighbor distance. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So, so here we see this with this picture, we can have an intuition how you can do this, right? So if you, if you draw a, a ball around one point, around two consecutive points, 
we can convince ourselves that uh, this, uh, the volume of this shell should scale with the, the local dimension, right, of the data set. Under central assumptions, right, you can, you can do this. All right, so in, in, in specific, the method that you use, it's called a uh, 2NN, so two nearest neighbor approach. Okay? So basically uh, this method, uh, uh, it's based on this expression here, this uh, prob oops, probability distribution here that you explain a bit more uh, uh, later. But basically the basic idea is so if you want to, to compute this intrinsic dimension, so you have your data set, right? You have your table or here, as I illustrate, you have the, and then for each point of your data set, you compute the first and the second nearest neighbor distance, right? And then you define this ratio, u, right? And what this uh, was showing this paper here, I, I won't explain how to arrive in this expression, but I, I would just mention that what was shown here in this paper is that the probability distribution of this quantity, this mu, is equal to this expression, right? So it, is, uh, so it depends on the intrinsic dimension, okay? So what you can do is that uh, you can, so if you have a data set, you can compute empirically this probability distribution. And then you fit to this expression, to this, let's call it Pareto distribution. Uh, and then like uh, fitting, you can uh, access, you can estimate, you can compute this intrinsic dimension. Okay, so this is the basic idea of this approach. And here uh, um, I'm showing uh, the examples that I show in the beginning. When, when, where I have these uh, very simplified data sets with just three spins, right? So here's the ferromagnetic phase and here's the disorder phase. And here we use this approach uh, to, to, to compute the intrinsic dimension. Indeed, we, we get uh, for, the, for the, the ferromagnetic case for the temperature equal to zero, you have an intrinsic dimension that's uh, close to one. And uh, in the high temperature regime, the intrinsic dimension uh, is equal to three, right? It's equal to the number of uh, uh, spins that you have in your data set, right? Okay, uh, so I won't enter in the details, but there are a lot of uh, uh, important things that you have to consider uh, uh, related to this calculation of the intrinsic dimension, right? So basically, uh, so in principle, your data set can be very complicated, right? So for example, in principle, you can have like segmentations in your data set, you have clustering in your data set, and but let me mention uh, just uh, two important aspects uh, related to, to, to this, uh, let's say, intrinsic dimension uh, obtained by this method. One is that, uh, so this is a local, uh, local feature of the configuration space, right? So when I estimate this intrinsic dimension, it's made uh, locally, let's say, in configuration space. And another important aspect uh, is that uh, this calculate so this intrinsic dimension it's a, it's called a, it's a, it's a scaly dependent quantity okay so basically it depends uh, the, the, the actual value of the intrinsic dimension depends on the number of points that you uh, have in your data set okay that so the, basically this number this nr what is called what we call nr uh, uh, defines the typical value of the distance between your points okay so this affects the intrinsic dimension so these are two important points, more technical, uh, we enter more in details, but it's important to understand the results that I will show uh, later on. Okay. All right, so now I think, now I will start to discuss some uh, results. Um, and again, let me return to the, what we, what we did, right? So basically we use this uh, 2NN approach to study, uh, to estimate the intrinsic dimension of data sets that emerge in the vicinity of uh, phase transitions, right? both classical and quantum. And it's just here is just a list of phase transitions that we consider, right? we consider like second order to the phase transitions, uh, what is called a Berezinsky costelitz staulis uh, phase transition and also first order transitions. And in our, uh, in our study, we, we just consider like, uh, uh, numerical experiments, right? Uh, so so the, these are data sets that uh, we generate with simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, okay? So basically you simulate, uh, uh, you generate the, using important sampling, the configurations of a partition function, right? Both classical and quantum. All right, so now let's start with the, the first example that you consider. And you consider with the simplest example that is the 2D Eisen model, the classical, okay? So there is no, quantum effects here. But basically this model uh, 
despite the simplicity, this model described a second order phase transition, right? And here, what you do is uh, if you sample, again, in the, the, the partition function, you'll have this, uh, this data set, okay? Uh, so now let me start showing the results, okay? So here, we, again, we cannot, uh, we cannot visualize the data set anymore, right? So then you, you have, later on, you have to do something else to try to understand the results, right? So basically, this data set, lives in a space that has dimension that uh, is equal to the number of spins, right? So it's a high dimensional space. And in this 2NN approach, I don't do any kind of dimension reduction. Okay, let's see the results and then you try to understand a bit better. Okay? Uh, but before that, let me just mention that, uh, so this is uh, we typically, so basically I simulate a finite size system, right? So, so here is a square lattice with a linear size equal to L. And we do that, when you do that, uh, and if you are close to a phase transition, we expect that physical quantities, at least physical quantities, should follow what is called this finite size scaling, okay? So basically like uh, the magnetization, for example, susce uh, magnetic susceptibility uh, shall follow uh, this uh, universal function, right? Let's say universal behavior, right? And this is due to the fact that uh, in the vicinity of a phase transition, the correlation, the, 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 flu, the correlation between the fluctuations of the, say, the order parameter, uh, 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 sorry. Okay. All right, so yeah, the, the, the correlation uh, should diverge uh, as this expression. All right, so now let's uh, discuss, the, show the results, right? And I, you present the results and then I explain. So basically what we observe is the following. So basically the intrinsic dimension as a function of temperature, right? So here is the behavior of the intrinsic dimension. So for very high temperatures, so basically the intrinsic dimension scales uh, as uh, the number of sites uh, as we, we expected. But then uh, as we decrease the temperature, we see a minimum, we see that the intrinsic dimension X beta minimum, okay? And another important observation here is that this minimum shifts uh, as you increase system size, this minimum shifts towards the, so the, this uh, vertical line here is the, is the, the, the value of the, 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 uh, the exact value of the, the transition, right? For the temperature that you have the phase transition, right? So this is the, the important observation that we, we, we notice. And another thing is that we can do finite size scaling with this quantity, right? We can, um, as we do with uh, physical observables like magnetization, we can do data collapse. And then we can extract uh, from the behavior of this quantity, uh, both the critical temperature uh, and the uh, critical exponent mu with a great accuracy, right? So, so these values here are, it's equal to the exact values within your bars. So this is the results that we observe, but uh, as I said, it's difficult to, to visualize the data set, right? So, because here I have a high dimensional data set. So what I do, I, I, uh, to try to understand better this result, I you, uh, again mention the results uh, that, we can, that we can obtain with uh, principal component analysis. And I you try to link the behavior of the intrinsic dimension with what is going on uh, in configuration space, right? So basically this is what you want to, to see and then try to understand a bit better this result. And basically what you have at the configuration space is that you have formation of clustering, uh, two clusters, right? As we cross the, the, the critical temperature, right? And the, to understand the, the physical uh, nature of these two clusters is simple for this case. So basically uh, the blue cluster uh, has the configurations with the majority of spins pointing up and the red uh, cluster has uh, configurations of the majority of spin point down. Okay, so basically this is what happens at the configurational space, right? So basically uh, as I cross the transition, there is this formation of clusters, right? And then we can understand why the intrinsic dimension um, uh, sh uh, at the end detect the transition, right? So basically when I, um, and here I show the results of the intrinsic dimension obtained by this method, this principal component analysis, right? And so in green, basically I consider the full data set, right? So basically, uh, and when I do this, basically the intrinsic dimension goes to one as I cross the transition. 
Okay, so basically, I just see like two points, right? The two clusters. Uh, but when I consider like what I call a local intrinsic dimension, so basically the data set here is just uh, formed by configurations of the majority of spin down. In this case, I see this minimum, right? So, and in fact, this 2NN approach uh, is a local probe, right? Is a local intrinsic dimension. So what, at the end, what I'm seeing is that uh, the intrinsic dimension uh, signalize, the trans signalize this uh, uh, structural change in the data set, right? So, so this is the basic. All right. So, okay, so this is, um, but this is, a, uh, let's say, a very simplified transition, right? So that we can even describe with this, uh, again, with this principal component analysis. Right? And the question is, can we still, uh, what's the, be the behavior of this transition dimension for all the kinds of the transition, right? That it's physically completely different from the, the, the 2D item, right? So here, as an example, I show, uh, I will show results of, of uh, an example of, uh, of uh, uh, a BKT uh, phase transition, a Berezinsko systolic phase transition. And this is an example, um, maybe the most famous example of uh, uh, a topological tra phase transition, right? So here we don't have a, order, a local order parameter, right? So, so basically this uh, phase transition is characterized by this uh, unbinding of uh, vortices, right? So, so basically it's a, a complete, physically it's completely different from the 2D eigen. And also the correlation length of this transition uh, uh, it uh, scales different uh, as I approach the, the critical point. And then uh, if, you, if, you, if you estimate the intrinsic dimension for this transition, what you observe is that you observe a, a very similar result for the, the, the 2D Eisen model. Okay, so basically uh, close the transition, I also observe a minimum in the behavior of the intrinsic dimension. Okay? And this minimal, uh, if you do a, a finite size scaling, uh, uh, shifts towards the, the value of the, um, the critical point. So the, basically this critical point in blue here is, uh, is not an exact value because this model cannot be solved exactly, but it's an estimation using other approaches, right? Very precise approaches, other numerical. And also you can do the data collapse of this. So the basic idea here is that we still can, uh, uh, um, let's say, we have the same behavior, of the, essentially like a very similar behavior of the, the 2D Eisen model despite it's a completely different transition. Okay, so yeah, so basically this is like the two main results. Let me um, also mention, briefly mention, like, so here is everything classical, right? So there, is, there was no uh, quantum mechanics uh, yet, but uh, we can also apply this, uh, these ideas, uh, these uh, two data sets that are, comes from a quantum system, right? So then, uh, it's still a partition function, right? So, but then here we, we have an operator, right? So basically we don't have an, a number anymore, right? We have an operator that is a quantum system, a quantum model, right? Um, but here you have to do something else to define the data set, right? You cannot simply, uh, it's not, uh, so basically what you do is that you can map this partition function in a, in a path integral, right? And we can define our data set as like an instance of this path integral, like slice of this uh, path integral, okay? So in this way, we can also define a data set uh, from a quantum system, right? And uh, more specifically, the, the models that we study, we consider like the model for at zero temperature. So like beta here is equal to infinite, like very large value of beta. Uh, so basically we, we consider like example of models that describe a quantum phase transition, right? So basically a phase transition that is uh, induced not by the temperature, but, uh, but by a parameter of the Hamiltonian, right? Um, and then we, we, again, we ask the same question, right? What's the behavior of the intrinsic dimension uh, in the vicinity of uh, these quantum critical points? And interestingly, what we observe, uh, so here, uh, Basically, we repeat the, 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 the results of uh, the classical system. What we observe uh, is that uh, the behavior of this, this intrinsic dimension is uh, very similar to the, the case observed for the classical system, right? So you also have this minimum of the intrinsic dimension, and we observe this kind of uh, uh, universal scaling behavior, right? This minimum, as increases system size, shifts towards the, the, the exact value of the critical point. So here, I won't enter into details, but I show an example of, uh, so here is a 1D quantum IZ model, and here's the 1D XXZ model. So this is like, like, this is like spin models, right? So that describe this uh, 
a second order phase transition and a BKT transition. Okay, so essentially we serve the same thing. Okay, so this, basically this is like our, let's say, uh, numerical experiments and what we, we observe. And then uh, just to, before I conclude, let me just oops, mention, right? So you also try to understand a bit better, like why so I think the main result here is uh, that this quantity, this increase in dimension, uh, so our numerics uh, strongly indicates that this quantity X bit universal scaling behavior, right? Across different kinds of phase transitions. And we try to explain that. And so here I won't enter into details, but the, the key point is that uh, <clears throat> we, so, so this quantity at the end is related to distance in configuration space, right? So here's a definition of distance that we use, the, the, uh, the Euclidean distance, right? And basically this distance depends on uh, this kind of correlations here. This is like an overlap between two configurations, okay? And at the end, this kind of, we can show that uh, in certain regimes that these kind of correlations are indeed related to physical correlations, right? Uh, so for that reason, uh, we should expect, right? That, so basically quantities related to distance should uh, follow at the end, universal scaling behavior. So this is, um, you know, so this is a, an explanation, right? Uh, why this quantity should expect uh, universal scaling behavior. And with that, I conclude, right? So I think the main message here I just mentioned, right? Is that we observe like that uh, in this interesting result that uh, like generic features of the data sets, flow data sets, like more specifically this intrinsic dimension, right? Uh, exhibit this, this kind of scaling behavior uh, in the vicinity of critical points, right? So we can really uh, use this to, to learn about phase transition in a purely unsupervised way. I would think. This is the main conclusion of this work. So we, now we are also, just to mention, we are starting to work also trying to uh, analyze like data sets coming from experiments like uh, with uh, uh, quantum systems, right? Uh, quantum simulators, okay? So the basic idea is that we are trying to propose new tools to probe uh, quantum anybody correlation, let's say. All right, so this is one, one outlook. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for the attention. So this is uh, my the, the collaborators. And thank you very much. And looking forward for the, the questions. We take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. Uh, so there's first, a, yeah, there's a question in the chat already. Yeah, I think I have to to stop the sherry, right? To to open the the chat because. Uh, oh. Ah uh, no, I can. Ah, I can. Uh, yeah, I can see now. I can see. Okay, uh, I would like to know the procedure to follow so as to know the dimensions of the first nearest neighbors. Thanks. Ah, yeah. So um, let's see uh, if I understood correctly. Uh, basically, it's like how to estimate the dimension, the intrinsic dimension, right? The question. Um, maybe I can. Uh, so basically, yeah. So uh, what I mentioned. So basically, I can return to this uh, part. So basically, what you need. So you have you, you have your data set, right? You have this. Uh, let's say this this uh, let's this file with. Uh, so each line of this file is one configuration or one picture, right? Uh, and then what you have to do is that we have, you have to, um, to compute distance between these configurations, right? Uh, for example, Euclidean distance. So of course the definition of distance is something important. You should be careful. Uh, and if you want to apply this uh, 2NN approach that we use it here. So basically what the only input that you need is uh, for each point of your data set, you have to compute the first and the second year's neighbor distance of this point uh, in relation to the, to the first and the second year's neighbor uh, point. Okay. And then we define this mu, right? For each point, we define this mu. And then with that, you can uh, uh, compute an empirical probability distribution, right? And then we fit uh, with this expression, right? Okay. Uh, indeed, we, so this is another aspect. So, uh, we, we can check that indeed the, the, the empirical probability, this, this is an important thing, follow this expression, right? Uh, this, this is a, let's call it a Pareto distribution. And then you fit to, 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 to compute the intrinsic dimension. So, so this is basically what we have to do. 
Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Please just want to know if you are dealing with dimensionless temperature. Dimensionless temperature? Um, you have you are in your system or your temperature of the unit. Ah, okay. So so basically here we consider a classical, what I, I call it like classical systems, like so basically. Uh, there, so the Hamiltonian is just a, a number, right? There is no the terms that do, doesn't commute, right? And in this case, uh, so the phase transitions are induced by temperature. So, so you change the temperature and then you have a phase transition. So in this case, the temperature is finite, let's say. But in the quantum examples that I show is a quantum phase transition, right? So there, the temperature, uh, the transition happens at t equals zero, right? Not sure if this is was the question. Uh, so for the quantum models that you consider, uh, the temperature is zero. It's a quantum phase transition. We call it quantum phase transition. Uh, hi, Tiago. Uh, very nice talk. I wanted to ask you about these uh, two things. No? So in this, if I understand properly, this intrinsic dimension is kind of universal. So in the phase transitions that you were showing at the end, so. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, what I say? Yeah, I uh, think, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you cannot distinguish which kind of phase transition. So if I understand now, you take some models that you know, where is the phase transition, you generate all this data numerically uh -huh. with Monte Carlo, and then you analyze this row data, and then you find this minima, yeah. uh, you do scaling, finite size scaling, and yeah. then you say, okay, it's the phase transition. Okay. But it doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. it doesn't give you more, yeah, I, um, I think I think you can you can even if you don't know the universality class, you can you can learn about what is the universality class, right? So uh, it's like so so for example, if I, if I was studying another model like the, the Potts model, you also study the Potts model, right? So basically we so basically the behavior is the same, right? Uh, you have this minimum, but the way that this minimum shifts and the data collapse, if you do the data collapse, of course you need to have clean data, right? gives you different numbers, right? Give you different uh, new. So this new here uh, is different if I do POTS model, right? So I think you, even if you don't know about the universality class, you can learn about it, I think. It's, it's, like, it's like as you do with the magnetization, right? If you have a model and so we can, we can compute the critical exponent uh, um, and then from, from this result, you can, uh, can detect what's the, you can learn about the result class. No, I just wanted to ask you, why do you use this uh, Euclidean measure in the quantum case and you don't use something similar to, uh, so a really quantum measure, so ah, for instance, okay. relative okay. entropy or something like that. Ah, I I found see, it. I uh -huh. Yeah, I think, I think this is a good question. Uh, yeah, so basically here we are, so we are not looking uh, this is in Hilbert space. So here's configurational space. So, so it's not, so it's like distance between, uh, let's say, wave function snapshots, right? Uh, so it's a bit different. So we are not probing the intrinsic dimension of the Hilbert space, but you are probing the intrinsic dimension of uh, the wave function snapshots or partition function snapshots. Of course, you can use other, you can use other definition of, there are other definition of distance. But uh, yeah, I think here, uh, so yeah, it's not a Hubert space. Uh, we're not probing the Hubert space uh, structure, let's say. We are probing like the configuration of space structure. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Tiago? Okay, so let's thank Tiago once again. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh,